So, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming again for the second and last day of academic training. Sorry, we are slightly late, but somebody left with a microphone from a yesterday afternoon's speakers, so we couldn't de facto start earlier. Uh, as a member of the IT uh, department, as a sponsor of this uh, lecture, I would like to remind everybody that uh, these lectures are supposed to teach you how these things work and not to encourage you to use certain resources for investigating further. And I leave the floor to the speaker because we have a lot of material and we prefer to have time for questions and answers. Thank you. Okay. So, were all of you here yesterday? Yes, okay, wow, You're brave enough to come back. Okay, so the question is, when you sort of try to get your head around Bitcoin, and you have to think about, okay, what is, what is value really? So, I mean, we, we value things like gold and silver, but is it based upon the, the is there some, some inherent value in them? I mean, gold is great for using on electrical contacts and things like that, but basically people just sort of put it into bars and, and uh, store it away or use it in jewelry and things like that because it's pretty. Um, you know, or is value sort of in demand for, the, for some sort of scarce resource? Is that what the value is? That seems sort of artificial. What happens if the, if the uh, suddenly the, the supply increases. Somebody finds a new uh, you know, mother load of, of gold where there's a huge quantity now suddenly available. What happens then? So one question is, is sort of like what are, we often think of value being associated with whatever uh, fiat currency we normally deal with. It's sort of like what is the currency you use to pay your taxes? What is the currency you use to pay your rent or your mortgage? Um, one interesting question that can kind of get you thinking about it is, okay, so if you pay in, in Swiss francs, uh, what is the value of 100 Swiss francs three months from now? It's 100 Swiss francs, right? But if I ask you what is the value of 100 euros three months from now, you'd say, mm, I'm not, I don't know. But if you pay so your taxes and your written mortgage in euros, you say, oh, well, 100 euros three months from now is 100 euros. But if I ask you what Swiss francs are going to be, you say, oh, my, I don't know. So we're all the time balancing different values and different exchange rates between different kinds of currency. So the same thing is true in Bitcoin. It's, it's a little strange to get your head around because it's, it's just a, a number. But if you think about, well, that's what your bank account is too, right? It's just a number. Okay, so we have this thing that we call a blockchain, which keeps track in a ledger form of all of the transactions that have occurred in, in Bitcoin. The first transaction, the Genesis block, was in... Uh, January 3rd of 2009. All these transactions are available for inspection. They're pseudonymous. They're not entirely anonymous because you can, with some, uh, with some difficulty, figure out basically who it is that's making transactions. So it, it can be difficult depending upon your skill in doing in analyzing the the transactions in the blockchain and also how skilled the person was at hiding their identity. So it's sort of like two different ways. But you can do things that help to hide your identity, but somebody can still sort of figure out what transactions you're doing. So there was this uh, article that was, in fact, published on the 27th that you can read about how people have, have claimed that they could basically figure out about 70% of the transactions in the, on the blockchain. So you do mining then, this mining process that we talk about that you're not supposed to do here at Slack. You don't do mining here. That's not, my God. CERN, thank you. 
<clears throat> uh, the mining is to prevent somebody from being able to spend a Bitcoin multiple times. So if you think about it, I could make a transaction with this person over here, and the transaction Okay, so if you think about the blockchain, it's sort of like, it's a history of all the transactions. It's sort of like archaeology in the sense that the top layers are maybe sort of changeable, just sort of like flowing around. Flowing you get into the, into the blockchain, those are much more, uh, much more immutable. Um, so we have this, this kind of history, and, and so the farther down, the more certain you are that this transaction is actually confirmed and is, and is going to uh, be valid. Now, based off of this blockchain idea, people have built a lot of alternative coins. In fact, if you go to this website here, there's actually like a full, more than a full page list of all sorts of alternative coins that people have designed, thinking that they could get around maybe this limitation or that limitation associated with Bitcoins. So for instance, uh, one thing would be an alternative for Kickstarter. So if you wanted to fund some new initiative, then here's the way to do it with uh, that's uh, documented in TechCrunch just very recently. So as a way to do crowdfunding, using Bitcoin, and basically all the money goes to the person actually doing, trying to start this initiative, not necessarily to, the, uh, to something like Kickstarter. So you're doing direct funding. That's one of the benefits of something like these alternative currencies is they're direct, peer-to-peer, -peer. they remove the middleman out of all these transactions. Um, another type of thing is music. Suppose that uh, you know you could uh, just pay somebody directly, pay the musician directly when you listen to a track, or that you could actually invest in in a in them producing a track or producing a uh, uh, an album. PeerTrax is actually funding this sort of this kind of effort to come up with um, sort of music coins, and the initial funding for that is ending just right now. If you went to this site, I think it would, I think it would probably say, okay, we have just uh, stopped stopped funding the site. So what people were doing was buying in, just sort of like initial investors, just like a startup. Um, you can replace stock changes with something like Bitcoin. Uh, the CEO of Overstock.com is really upset about all the intermediaries associated with buying and selling uh, shares of stock. You could become like a company, I think we talked about this yesterday, sell shares in yourself. You of course want to keep some of yourself that, that you own, you don't want to sell all of them. But but you know you sell shares in yourself if you've got an idea. Smart contracts described in this Wikipedia article where you can basically control with a language in the in the Turing uh, in the transaction about what are the conditions under which a coin is paid out. Uh, a replacement for the domain name system DNS. 
uh, it's called Namecoin. So there are all sorts of things here. This is an incredibly disruptive technology. It has the, the possibility of, of just completely restructuring the way that we do things. The fact that you can, uh, the fact that you can carry on these transactions by trusting the technology, you trust the cryptography and the technology associated with the protected transaction, and it doesn't require any trust in the person that you're doing the transaction with. So, okay, as we've said, the blockchain is a ledger of all the transactions since the start of time. Um, but the bet definition of a blockchain doesn't specify what is in the transaction. So we group the transactions into blocks. These transactions flow out across the network. These miners group, gathered these transactions together, put them into blocks. First block was the genesis block, as we said. New blocks are added by consensus. So when a miner declares, I found a block, he broadcasts that to the network. And people then add that to their version of the blockchain. So everybody and it was this running a full node in in uh, in Bitcoin has a copy of the whole blockchain. Each block points to the previous block, that's why it's a chain. Sometimes there are different versions of the chain. So two different miners will get a block that both points to the same block, and that's called a fork. Then people will start building on two different versions of the chain. And eventually what happens is somebody notices that one of these versions of the chain is longer than the other. And when they do, then everybody gives up on the shorter one and goes over to the longer one. So that means that just because somebody has mined a block that contains your transaction, doesn't necessarily mean it is actually confirmed. It might get tossed away. To be mined, it'll be mined later, presumably, but just because it's been mined once doesn't mean it will, it will be actually verified. So the idea here is then, by consensus, you prevent double spending because only one of the transactions that spend a particular coin will be considered valid. That's part of the validity testing that goes into these blocks. So, okay, so you have, again, if you have a fork, you start building two chains and then one of them eventually becomes longer and that's the one that wins and the others go away. That's why it's important to make sure that these mining pools that we talked about yesterday stay below 51%. We'll talk about that a little later. So the full chain is 25 gigabytes. So if you download a full client wallet, full node, it will download all 25 gigabytes to your computer. Now you can see how much it's grown. This, probably can't read it, this is a year ago. Okay, so it's gone. January. So this was about uh, two and a half gigabytes. So it's grown by 10 gigabytes in the last year. That doesn't look like it's a linear curve either. So this is, this is going up pretty quickly. Okay, so the blocks are mined and added to the chain based on this verified thing that we called proof of work. We talked a bunch about proof of work yesterday. And so the miners assemble this block of transactions, and then once they've got this block together, they try to solve a problem. And this problem is coming up with an additional number that they hash with a block header to, to make the, uh, the subsequent hash smaller than a certain number. So the average time to add a new block is 10 minutes. At the current rate, they can the maximum transaction rate is about seven per second. That's the maximum rate. 
based upon this 10 minutes per block and the average transaction size and the fact that a block has a limit of about a megabyte. Okay, so the current average transaction rate is about one per second. We get about 80,000 transactions per day. I mean, if you remember when we looked at blockchain.info yesterday and you could see the transactions going by, it was roughly about one a second. So the full network node, when you download that, as I said, takes uh, greater than 25 gigabytes. And of course, that's beyond the capability of most mobile devices. So they, have an, they don't participate fully in the Bitcom network. They have an abbreviated version that they, uh, that they maintain. So this is a seven day average of the number of transactions that's going back to uh, January. So this is basically like the last year. I'm sorry, the last two years. January of uh, 2013. Now it's interesting because look at this, look at this spike here. It's sort of like amazing. What happened there? So that happened in November of last year. And so I looked over at the, what was the value of the Bitcoin? Well, this is where it, the value skyrocketed up to uh, almost $1,300. That was when the Chinese started using Bitcoin to move money out of China. And it goes back right here is where the Chinese government woke up and said, no, 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 you can't do that. And so the demand immediately dropped off. And then there were actually even some further restrictions right in here and also Mount Gox, which was a one big, a really big exchange shuts down. And so that dropped the price again here. And you can see it's sort of leveled off now uh, at around, you know, it's, it's, it's going up and down around between 350 and three and $400 per, uh, per Bitcoin at the current time. But there was that incredible price bubble. And of course, as you can see, a very large number of transactions that were occurring at that, at that point in time. So let's talk about proof of work. The amount of work that is required dy is dynamically changes. So uh, you want to, to, uh, to be able to mine a block, one block about every 10 minutes. Uh, so every 2016 blocks, they reevaluate what the average amount of time to mine a block is and dynamically adjust up and down how much work it should take to mine one. And 216, 2016 blocks happens about every two weeks. So about every two weeks they adjust the difficulty. So as we said, the problem was to find that nonce so that the cryptic hash of the, of the block header and the nonce fits below some, has some number of binary zeros initially, currently about 40. So once that problem is solved, the miner who has solved it transmits that block to all of the nodes and it goes spreading out across the, uh, the Bitcom network. So all the, the miners are, are the, the, the network, people with full nodes are all connected sort of peer to peer. So, it's, so it's, it's not through any central server. It's like when you download a, uh, a wallet and become part of the Bitcom network, you, you pick up a couple of close neighbors and then those are the ones that you send transactions to and receive transactions from. Um, so of course the reward for mining a block is 25 is currently 25 bitcoins plus any of the transaction fees that are in the transactions that are included in that block so you get 25 and usually now the transaction fees are typically pretty low it will be like maybe a tenth of a bitcoin in addition to the 25 bitcoins 
So there are some issues with the proof of work. Um, as we said yesterday, the idea that uh, Satoshi had about this peer-to-peer -peer network would be that all of the verification would be very spread out and not centralized. He didn't want any central authority associated with Bitcoin. However, what has happened is that the mining is, is so much work that, what is, that they have, the miners have formed pools. And there are three or four pools that now account for 75% of the mining. So it's sort of like, even though with the best intentions, what's happened is it's, it's, it's become more centralized again. And in fact, one of the mining pools at one point in time reached over 51% uh, percent of the mining capability. And this raised all sorts of alarms. And so they backed off and said, we promise we won't do more than 30%. Um, so yeah, GHash IO is the one that actually exceeded 50%. Um, so another problem is this rate of seven transactions a second. God, that's, that's not enough to, uh, to, to support you know, serious financial uh, transaction rate. So, uh, so it doesn't it doesn't scale up, and so people are looking at what changes potentially that could be made to the algorithms, so that it could be scaled up, or so that you could remove this kind of restriction. Uh, another problem is that the reward that you get, 25 bitcoins, is barely pays for the mining. As we said yesterday, unless you can get somebody else's electricity, don't do it here. Um, it takes buying the mining equipment and paying for the electricity, you'll maybe break even in about a year. That's breaking even. Uh, you know, it, it might help warm your house during the winter, things like that. But, so you could maybe save on your, uh, your, your heating bill. Um, so another problem here is that this the increase in value, so you get more Bitcoins. 25 Bitcoins are sort of added to the total number of bit Bitcoins every 10 minutes, right? So there's an increase in the number of Bitcoins. Where does that value go? This value is, it goes externally. It's paid out for hardware and electricity. So the sort of increase in value associated with the Bitcoins goes out of the Bitcoins network somewhere else. And all this effort, 300 petahashes a second, all this effort is solving a problem that nobody really cares about. I mean, so, so, so for instance, there, there is one coin where the problem is to solve prime numbers. Or to find, you know, to find prime numbers, and at least that is at least more useful than finding a hash with a certain number of zeros on the front of it. So there is an alternative coin called Prime Coin that does that. So, so this is, I mean, this is sort of a real problem. This, all of this is, all this work is done, 300 petahashes a second, for basically no, nothing that's useful at all. The difficulty here is that you need to find a problem that it's difficult to solve and easy to verify. Because once somebody has solved a problem, everybody needs to check to see, did they really solve it? And so that has to be cheap to do. So figuring out whether somebody's found a prime number or whether or not they've got the right hash, those are relatively easy things to verify. But there, it's difficult to find it initially. So. Like I said, numerous strategies are being developed to try to address these problems. Um, I'm going to defer the blockchain.info. We've looked at that a little bit yesterday, so you already sort of know what that's like. Uh, so wallets. Um, there are a variety of wallets. We talked about some of those yesterday. Uh, in terms of getting started, 
I looked around at, at a bunch of wallets to what, you know, how to, how to get started. It turned out that Coinbase was, if you just want to start playing around with it, Coinbase is popular and it has a reasonable, simple to use interface. Uh, it is cross-platform on a number of different platforms that you would be tempted to use. Uh, and it includes multi-sig capability. We'll talk about what that is. And it's currently, at, initially, when a lot of the reviews were written, it said, you know, use Coinbase if, you could, if you're in the U.S. and can interface to a U.S. bank. But uh, the latest information is that Coinbase is currently in 19 different countries, including most of the ones in Europe. Pardon? Yes. Right, the 19 countries is the exchange that you can buy, you can buy currency, you can exchange currency with, the, with banks in those countries. But once you get the Bitcoin, then you can use it, you can use it anywhere. So I used Coinbase to buy a quarter of a Bitcoin and you had to go through an exercise where it verifies your bank account by making two small deposits to your account and then you have to go back and tell it, well, these were the size of the deposits and so then that verifies your bank account and then you can buy something and then it has to go through the whole ACH process to transfer the money. And so last Wednesday, I purchased a quarter of a Bitcoin and today, by the end of the, of the day in California, I should receive my quarter Bitcoin into my wallet. So, uh, One thing is that Bitcoin, when you set up the wallet, will automatically give you one dollar's worth, or maybe one euro's worth of, or one Swiss franc's worth of, of Bitcoin right in the wallet, so you can sort of see what it looks like. Uh, there are other wallets. Uh, I would advise you to sort of look around at some of the reviews. It's really difficult because the capabilities of these wallets are changing very rapidly. And so it's easy to read a review that was written two or three years ago. And the wallet has significantly changed in terms of, of features since then. Uh, however, multi-bit is also a well-regarded uh, well uh, cross-platform wallet. Armory is considered the safest one, but of course, you know what security and, and usability mean, sort of like, it's always like this, right? Security goes up, usability goes down. So Armory is considered very safe cross-platform and it's more difficult to use. Uh, there are hardware wallets you can use where you, they store your private keys off of the computer and then you attach it by, to, to the computer with a, uh, it is a USB stick. One of these is a Tracer. There's also another one uh, that can be used. And, uh, and of course, then there are uh, paper wallets where you can print out your private key and, and keep it on paper. Um, in your country, there's, a, there's this reference link, howtobuybitcoins.info, which basically says, buy country. What, uh, how you can how you can buy bitcoins? So these wallets then provide your. That's the same. Okay. Okay. So as we said, you can connect them to a bank account. When you initially connect to the bank account. It, I mean, what, with Coinbase, it said, okay, we can either make a couple of deposits and it will take, you know, I have to tell me what the deposits are, or you can just give me your user ID and password and we'll log into your uh, bank directly. It's like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. So we went through the, the two little deposits thing. Um, so that verification can take a, a couple of days for that to happen. And then when you want to buy Bitcoin, of course, that takes several days if you use the bank, or you can supply them with your credit card information. <laughs> yes. If you, if you want immediate gratification to, to be able to buy Bitcoin, I also wasn't willing to do that. Um, 
So then the wallet will have different accounts in it. And you can have sort of a quick access thing where that would be sort of like cash. Okay, it'd be like, be like the cash you'd carry around in your pocket to, to, uh, to make exchanges. And then the, uh, the Coinbase wallet also has a vault that you can put money in. You can put Bitcoins in this vault and to take them out, there's a two day delay. That's the default is to get money out of the vault requires you, that you think about it two days in advance, and then you can then you can take it out. So, as you can as you can imagine, that provides some safety factor, uh, not only so that you don't spend it too quickly, but also so that uh, you can, if something happens, you can uh, maybe intercept the bad guys before they actually get the money out of your vault. Um, one of the features that Coinbase has is they have a a standard vault, which has one signature required to spend, to get money out of it. And that signature is, is sort of shared. Basically, uh, Coinbase has that. And so if Coinbase disappears, unless you have a backup, your money disappears. Just like what happened with uh, Mt. Gox. OK, so what you can have is multi-sig which protects you. We'll see a slide in just a little bit that, that, about how that works. It's where it takes two out of three signatures to be able to actually spend the money. And you also need to configure backup. There are different configurations of wallets. Um, there's what is called a hierarchical, hierarchical, yallet, hierarchical wallet that once you have sort of the starting seed where it generates these random addresses, uh, you can reconstruct them and, and get back your money if you happen to, to lose the wallet. Uh, some wallets aren't that way. And if you lose the wallet and you lose the private keys that are in it, that the coins are gone. I mean, just gone. So when you configure the backup, you have to think about what you need to back up. Remember, the wallet is generating all of these different receive from addresses, that long thing that started with a one. It's generating those like a new one for every transaction. Each one of those has a private key associated with it. So each time you receive bitcoins from somebody, you have another private key. So you back up your wallet. Well, that's fine for that point in time. But if you then lose your wallet, you lose all the coins that you received since the last backup. So you need to think about how often you need to, uh, to back up your wallet because it's money, that, it's money that you're losing, not just data. So here's how multi-sig works. <clears throat> uh, the most common form of multi-sig here is, is so two out of three signatures. So there are three signatures associated with, with the, the vault or the, the account. Any two of those signatures will be able to uh, extract the money. So the idea is here's Coinbase. It has a key. And then you have a key that you have that can be, that is, you can unlock with like a user ID and password kind of thing, but it's encrypted, and you send that to Coinbase. So Coinbase doesn't know what the second key is, but it's shared between you and, and Coinbase. And then there's an, a third key, which only you have. So what this means is that, sort of for simplicity, anytime you want to get money out of this vault, you just talk to Coinbase, you unlock this key. It has the other key, so that's two. It unlocks the the money out of the wall. Now, suppose Coinbase disappears. In a normal case with two out of three, Coinbase disappears, you're done. But now you have a key that you can unlock, and then you have this other key here that gives you two. So you can unlock the money out of the wallet. So this is protection for you in case 
uh, in, in case something like Coinbase would disappear from the, uh, from the face of the earth. So this allows you to maintain your own control. The wallet addresses, the ones that we saw, remember, start, all started with one. Uh, for multi-sig, they start with three. Now, one thing you have to be careful of is that not this is a new feature, so not all of the software supports this. So uh, it, it will take some time for every, everybody to catch up. So there are a bunch of best practices associated with dealing with walnuts, wall, walnuts, wallets. Uh, so you want to distribute money between different wallets, just like you have different accounts, uh, and use a variety. You have a desktop wallet, a wallet that you use on your phone, an offline wallet, just like you have savings accounts and checkings accounts and, and, and carry cash and those kinds of things. Those are used for different purposes. Use multi-sig wallets where possible. Make regular backups. Make sure that you encrypt your wallet so that <clears throat> if somebody steals your laptop or steals your phone, they don't have direct access to it. And there are a variety of, uh, of good encryption algorithms available. Good passphrases. Remember. The attackers have, you know, millions and millions of passwords that people use. And the question is, can you actually come up with a password that nobody else has thought of? Now, typically, most passwords start with a capital letter, have some number of lowercase letters, and then some number of digits and depending upon the constraint, end with an exclamation point. Okay, that's the typical strong password. All right, we're all forced to pick a strong password, and so we all pick one that looks exactly like that. So don't do that. You have to come up with a good passphrase. And if you have to use a password manager to generate random long string for you, that probably is even better. This is all new software. Even old, you know, you have to be careful of even old software, but especially new software is going to have security issues. And they're going to be found, and they're going to be fixed, which means you have to keep your software up to date. Always make sure you have the current version. So there's more detail in terms of these uh, best practices at this URL that I would encourage you to go to. OK, so how does a transaction work? Suppose you go into a store, and they accept Bitcoin, and you want to buy something. So how does it work? What happens is that the, the uh, store owner would basically say, OK, I'm going to request that you pay me some amount. And there would be an option there that says, uh, display a QR code. So the QR code gets displayed and says, waiting. You open your wallet and say, I want to pay. And your phone will read that QR code that's a request. And you say, pay that amount. And then that's it. That's a transaction. That's that's. That's how it works. That transaction then goes out across the Bitcoin network and is will be eventually validated and confirmed. Yes. It's for all the world. No, you might get in first. Well, or, or you, you know, you can get, you can get there earlier. Well, no. So, so to be confirmed, you would have to wait like ten minutes. That's when the next block is going to get, is going to get mined, right? However, typically, I, I'm not sure about here, but typically in the U.S., you know, where you have the the mag card stripe and then you sign, 
in many stores, if the amount is under a certain amount, they don't even bother with the signature. I mean, it doesn't mean anything anyway, since they can't even see what scribble you make on the on the little screen. Uh, so, like for at the grocery store I shop at, if the amount that I'm buying is under fifty dollars, I don't ever have to sign anything. If I go to Costco, which is a big box store, I don't have to sign if it's under hundred dollars. So the same sort of rules would tend to apply here for smaller transactions. You're not going to have to wait until the block is is, is verified. That's ten minutes. For it to be really verified, the standard rule is it has to be six deep in the blockchain. That's an hour. So nobody's, <laughs> nobody's going to wait that long, except you might wait that long if you're buying a car using Bitcoin. Because it takes that long to fill out all the other paperwork anyway. Yes? That's right, but that also takes, if you're using a standard wallet, there's no way to do that. It takes some level of sophistication that is beyond the capability of most people to be able to do that. And merchants, now don't, don't forget, merchants, when you get this money, assuming the transaction is validated, then you get it. No chargebacks. It's like you, get, you, it's like you gave them cash. Okay, so there are no chargebacks with Bitcoin, and that's one of the, the banes of existence of a, of a merchant, particularly if you're buying with a credit card, is they don't know when the transaction might be refused and they're going to have to eat it on a chargeback from the credit card company. And so that's a significant issue for them. Yes? I'm sorry, is that what? Uh, no, they'll... They're, they will go into the unmined transaction pool, and, and it'll be mined later, if they're still if they're valid. If it detects that a double spend, then one of the then one of the transactions will be invalidated. Yes. Ah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. No, I forget it by then. All right, so so the transaction. So this is pretty flexible. You can not only use this sort of in-person thing with the with the uh, with the camera using the camera on the phone. You can also send SMS messages. You can send bitcoins via email. Uh, all sorts of different ways. It's useful for micro payments. So it's easy to to make a payment of like ten cents or even half a cent or whatever. You know. Because the smallest denomination that you can spend is a Satoshi, which is 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. So you can actually send 100 millionth of a Bitcoin to somebody. Um, so there are simple plugins that you can put on your web page to request donations or to, or, uh, or you know, contributions for some cause, or even just to say, yeah, I like this. I like this blog post that you wrote, I'll give you 10 cents or I'll give you 5 cents for that. Uh, so except for the mining fee, all the funds go to the, to the person that you're sending the money to, um, which is different than, this is another reason that merchants are more likely to, to, to take a chance on whether or not the transaction is actually going to go through, because they're going to get all the money, they're not going to lose three or four percent of it to the credit card company. <clears throat> so if you think about getting all of these transactions coming in, it's all of these coins coming in, you think about you get this big bag of coins eventually, or even as you spend things, you're going to get little, little amounts of change back. So how does all that work anyway? Because it feels, seems like your wallet would kind of fill up with all these small amounts of money. Uh, well, what happens is after a while, the wallets will initiate a transaction when they reach about 100 small amounts, 100 different amounts. 
they'll send a transaction through that basically consolidates all of the small amounts into one bigger amount. And so you have like a single coin then in your wallet. Um, so the wallet addresses, as we've seen, uh, is an identifier that is tied not to you necessarily, but to a wallet. It identifies an account within your wallet that the income goes into. It starts with either one or three, as we've seen. It's tied to your, it's not tied to your identity. Uh, you should use a different address for every transaction. And here's the sample address. They look really unmemorable. Um, they are not anonymous. It is possible to tie these back to an IP address. So again, there's the reference to that, uh, to that one place uh, where they were able to do that. Now, we've talked about uh, proof of work type things. We've talked about the problems of proof of work. So there are also alternatives to this. There's proof of burn, proof of ownership, proof of stake. Proof of burn is kind of interesting. What you do is you, instead of actually performing, directly performing work, uh, or paying money to the uh, electricity uh, uh, utility, you send a certain number of bitcoins to an address. And this address is basically it's sort of like a dead drop. You send the bitcoins there, and they can't be spent. There's, there's sort of like there's nobody there. So you send the bitcoins to this address, so, and based on the number of bitcoins you burn because they're, they're no longer usable by anybody, that will change the amount of work that you have to do to actually do the mining. So say instead of 40 bits of zeros, if I send uh, you know, a couple of bitcoins over there, then I only have to do 30 bits of zeros in the hash. So I, it relaxes, it eases a lot the amount of work that I have to do uh, to do the mining. And what this does in this case is you burn these bitcoins. You're not paying as much money to the electric utility and to the hardware people again. Because you've burnt these bitcoins and they're no longer usable, they're lost, it basically is deflationary and it raises the value of the bitcoin for everybody else that has bitcoins. So there are, so it has some direct value to the whole Bitcoin economy. And it also doesn't use as much uh, energy doing actually useless things. So that one's uh, kind of an interesting concept. No, it's, it's one of the possibilities. And people, people have, there's this long list of coins that are being proposed in various ways. It's certainly not implemented for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is going to go on like it, like it currently is. That doesn't mean that people won't come up, or that doesn't mean that it will be the thing that goes on forever, that people won't come up with alternative coins. I mean, think about the auto industry and how many of those, uh, how many of those uh, early manufacturers are still in existence now. So autos were also a disruptive technology. I mean, so uh, side chains are a way to sort of allow experimentation in other kinds of these things. So there's a, that's getting a lot of interest right now because people are looking for alternative ways, but they don't want to mess with the Bitcoin code. There's the, the reference code that Satoshi wrote and everybody wants to make sure that if you know if you re implement it somehow that it still is consistent with with that reference code uh, but everybody's scared to make a change directly there or a change directly to the current blockchain so you have side chains which basically allows you to put some bitcoins in escrow in the blockchain and then take that value out do a bunch of transactions over here at the side using some other kinds of algorithms to see how that works. And then you can always exchange that back at a later date. So it's a way of transferring it. 
it back in. Uh, Ethereum is a new uh, coin that's just going to be available early next year. Uh, it's got a scripting language in it. Remember we talked about the scripting language in Bitcoin being sort of a restricted version of fourth. Um, this is Turing complete. So you can write any program in there that you want, which should be really interesting. Uh, and has a lot of possibilities I think that people are just going to be starting to dream about. And then there are all sorts of other altcoins. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about quickly is this idea of proof of stake. So the difficulty of producing a block in this case depends on how many bitcoins you own. So if you have a lot of not, I'm sorry, it wouldn't be bitcoins in this case, it would be some other kind of alternative coin. So there are many variations. This pure coin is hybrid, so here the mining difficulty is proportional to how many coins you have. However, it still takes an hour for a transaction to be secure. Uh, the next coin, the shareholder produces a block determined by stakes. It's still necessary for to have 10 blocks for security, and even then the level of security isn't clear. Uh, Tap OS, every transaction has a hash of the previous block and no way to decide who gets to generate the next block. So there's still some work going on there. There's this thing called delegated proof of stake where the people that have the coins or have the shares delegate their voting power, uh, delegate the mining based upon uh, votes. So every transaction transfers votes from one delegate to another. Votes can be for or against. No delegate is allowed more than 2% in the top in number of delegates take turns in generating a block. So for instance, like the top 100 delegates get to actually take turns mining a block. Uh, whatever the average transaction fee for that set of say 100 blocks is, all the delegates receive an equal share of all of the total of the fees. Since the order of the delegates is known, there's a, they could have a direct network connection. So this means that the transfer of knowledge about the mined blocks uh, spreads very quickly, so there's a much less of a problem in terms of network latency. It is a consensus algorithm like this other uh, coin called Ripple. Uh, however, the delegates, because they can be voted in or out, they're incentivized to be to uh, act in sort of uh, a good fashion. So one thing that uses this is is the thing called bit shares. They have these decentralized autonomous companies. They're defined as a distributed, self-organizing, self-enforcing company. So you have to reimagine bitcoins as not really bitcoins, but shares in a company. So they have, there's a bit shares toolkit that simplifies building one of these uh, distributed autonomous companies. It's open source software. You can sell shares. This is what you can use to say, for instance, sell shares in yourself or in an idea. You can buy stock in songs and musicians. There's no need for a stock exchange. As of November 5th, 2014, BitShares is a manned community supporting an unmanned company that produces innovative currencies, <clears throat> whatever that means. Uh, so one of the things they have is this thing called bit assets that you can buy with your bit shares. And a bit asset is a derivative asset based upon things like US dollar, the euro, uh, Swiss franc, gold, Bitcoin, etc. Um, so there's a, a, a uh, wiki on, on bit shares about how the bit assets work. The idea is that you have to have bit shares to participate with bit assets. You give up bit shares if you want to go long on a particular asset by the bit USD or something like that. If you want to go short on an asset, you have to put up an escrow two times the amount that you want to short an asset. So if you just have these bit shares, uh, they pay dividends. So you get so you get interest. This is important for people that just sort of buy and hold. They get a portion of the transaction fees. The shorts give up their interest, and that's where it the, the long people get to uh, get the interest from. Uh, 
it tracks a real world asset. So it tracks a dollar or uh, tracks a euro. And to understand how it works, I would advise you to go to this URL about how there's a, a bookie Bob um, that gives a description of how, of how it actually would work in the real world. Now, <clears throat> here's a graph of the value of Bitcoin since the 25th of August. And you can see it's kind of been floating down and floating around in terms of the value. This is the value of the BitUSD. And notice it's basically very flat, even, with, even at a fairly low volume level. You would expect at a higher volume level, it would be even, uh, there would see, be even less variation. So it very, basically very closely tracks right or at it's worth a dollar. So the idea is that if you have BitUSD and you pay a merchant in BitUSD or BitEuro, they are, would be more comfortable because they know they're going to get a euro at the other, you know, when they, when they try to cash it in. Uh, so there are many online references, many flavors of, of DAX or D, Distributed Autonomous Organization is the other uh, acronym. So you can use your favorite search engine. This is a disruptive technology. So a lot of people, a lot of institutions are going to be threatened by this. With the automobile, they passed laws so that you had to have somebody walk in front of the car 30 yards and warn people that a, that a you know a horseless carriage was coming. Okay, that was a disruptive technology. So there are going to be a lot of forces that try to figure out how to uh, make these things not be popular, not work. So. Uh, there's going to be intense lobbying that by the financial institutions and other people that are going to be threatened by this technology to have the governments pass laws and regulate it. So I encourage you to explore, uh, but explore carefully. <laughs> wow, 12.02, great. Oh my God. <laughs> so, I start from here, then you pass the mic. We have three questions. Okay, so who actually, is, is there a centralized um, a standard API for, or a standard library that's used for Bitcoin? Uh, certainly the Satoshi code has a standard API, okay. but you know that's not necessarily the easiest one to use and, and some of the other Depending on what level you want to get into yeah. the, and make, make calls to it, then uh, so a lot of the wallets have other kinds of APIs. And those, those libraries, are the implementation is, is a derivative of the Satoshi implementation? Yeah. Or how do they, how do, I guess my question is, how do they check um, to make sure that somebody's API, somebody's implementation of these algorithms is secure and there's no you know, backdoors or anything that they've Put in there. Uh, well, that's one reason for picking an open source version. Right. Okay. Um, I, I had two remarks. Um, if you go back to slide 11. Yeah, here you, you said uh, the reward barely pays for the hardware and the energy to mine. But I don't see how this is an issue. This is just the market. Because if you mine and you mine your bitcoins and you sell them for dollars to pay your electricity bill, the price will be just above what you need to pay your electricity because there is competition. So I don't see how this is an issue. Well, I mean, it can be an issue because if you're expecting to get rich mining, okay. then that's, you have to expect that this is, going, this is a marketplace. The other thing is whoever has the cheapest electricity is going to win. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, and so, for instance, doing the Bitcoin mining in nor more northern, colder climates is going to be less expensive, assuming they have cheap mm. electricity because you don't have to pay for the heating or, the, yeah. or for the cooling, right. things like that. So there are all sorts of considerations like but that. But it's not a problem for the proof of work or for the protocol. I mean, this is an economical 
yeah, statement. Could, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I just want to make the point that you're not going to get rich. Okay. Yeah. Oh, too bad. Um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, slide 13. Yeah, here, I think there is really, uh, the, the title of this slide shouldn't be wallet setup. It is uh, creating an account on an exchange website. Because a setup, the, to, to set up a wallet, it takes one second with a client and it's not linked to a bank account. A wallet is not linked to a bank account. It's just the place where you have your Bitcoins, right? Right, well, the wallet has the accounts in it. Yeah, but you, I mean, have, connect to bank accounts, that's the first line. That doesn't, that's not connected with the wallet setup. Well, I mean, when you download a wallet, it's sort of not useful until you can find some way to get Bitcoin into it. And yes. And typically what you do is connect it to some Bitcoin. You don't have to, true, you don't have to. You could buy Bitcoin from your friend. Yes. So, yeah, okay. yes. So that was just my point. I mean, because yeah. it could be misleading that, uh, I mean, why do you have to, the idea of Bitcoin was to get rid of middlemen and banks. Right. So. Right, or you could go to an ATM and feed, it, feed in cash. Yeah. I am coming around. Sorry. Okay, I don't really understand the whole anonymous aspect of the Bitcoins. For example, if I want to create an anonymous wallet, I still have to go to an exchange and provide my info to people to buy the Bitcoins. For example, if I want to connect it to a bank account, I've pretty much given them everything. If I want to buy Bitcoins using credit card, it's the same thing. If I want to buy it online with any means that's connected to me, it's pretty much not anonymous technology and it can be traced back to me. For example, if I want to buy, I don't know, anything that is not legal. So how really can I buy anonymously Bitcoins? There are ATMs that you can put cash in and we'll... Yeah, but okay, uh, yeah, the ATMs or go to buy them from a bank, but then I'm still recorded that I'm doing it, so... Okay, and you can buy Bitcoin from somebody else. Give them cash. Yeah, but also, sorry, but except in the, okay, but except giving cash, are there no other ways to get anonymously Bitcoins? Because this is kind of, again, destroying the purpose of the technology. I could just go to the person I want to buy the thing and give him cash. If I want to do everything remotely in an anonymous matter. Right. <laughs> okay, we're not speaking about the legal ways, but for example, if one complete anonymity and I don't want to be tracked in any way, because you said that this is like, a, how do you say it, uh, mm, this is an alternative to the banking there, system? There, are, there are, are alternative coins that are claimed to be more anonymous than Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't claim to be anonymous, it's pseudonymous. It's harder to find mm -hmm. out who you are. You don't necessarily, it's not necessarily tied to your identity, but it can be tied to your IP address and all sorts of other things that can be used to identify you, even though, even though you have gotten the Bitcoin in some anonymous fashion. So even if you get it in an anonymous fashion, when you try to spend it, you know, you can be tracked back to your IP address, so. Okay. Uh, I have a double question first. Uh, how well is the protocol doing uh, with the tax office and income uh, declaration? And on the other side, if there could be a centralized point like a non-profit organization that could kind of be running some scripts inside the protocol so that it can collect the activity. So even though keeping uh, your uh, transactions anonymous, to have a declaration back to the tax office about what was your income, for example. So to keep your activity anonymous, but at least to be more legal in a way. You know, I don't know about the other countries. I know in the U.S., the Internal Revenue Service there is treating Bitcoin as property. So, so it's considered to be property. So as you buy and sell, then you're, you, know, you either have short-term or long-term capital gains uh, that would be associated with that. And if you contribute, then it would be sort of the same as if you contributed property to a charity or something like that. Every country, I think, is wrestling with exactly how to deal with this. And a lot of them maybe haven't even caught up with the idea of how to deal with it yet. So it's sort of like watch this space to see how uh, 
to see how it develops. Uh, it's right now it's just not clear. And as if Bitcoin or some other alternative coin starts to take off, then there'll be a lot more pressure to figure out, you know, how the government's going to get their share. Does that answer your question? I suggest we have two last questions. So the only one I see, ah, let me give first to Pavel because he hasn't asked anything before we go back to persons who have asked before. You mentioned yesterday that the limit is 32 millions of bitcoins, yeah? 42. 42. What will happen once the world will reach this limit? Then no more bitcoins will be created by mining, and the miners will have to receive their money through the fees that are paid on the transaction. It's, it's sort of like this is, we're talking about 2040. Okay, it's when this happens. So, so but you can always, always say, okay, it's somebody else's problem, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it may be m more than you. <laughs> but, uh, what, what could happen in the future from the uh, economical point of view? Or, um... I mean, at that point in time, what happens is that people keep losing Bitcoins. And so it's like a, it's then a, become sort of deflationary and the value of bitcoins could increase because there are no there are no, no more new bitcoins being created and actually some are being destroyed or lost and so you know the value then slowly goes up i mean it, it's sort of like one of those things that okay something else will probably replace bitcoin before then anyway so you know, the question is, how much time should you worry about that? Other than the fact that that you know that there is a fixed quantity, and it's not just up to some government who wants to print money that's going to that's going to create more of these bitcoins all the time. So that's supposed to be one of the advantages: is that it's sort of like it's not under anybody's central control. It's this distributed consensus system that it has a specific algorithm that says this, this is the way that bitcoins are going to be produced. Another 25 bitcoins every 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Very last question before okay. we thank the speaker again. Okay, so you mentioned that these, uh, obviously these problems we're trying to solve here are pretty much useless with the hashing, right? So trying to obtain the correct number of zeros. Um, could you give some examples of maybe some problems that uh, either are being implemented by other, by alternative coins, or that could be implemented that are actually useful to society and can contribute with all this competing power? Uh, the, I mean, sort of the only one that I know of is the, is the prime coin, finding prime numbers. Mm. Um, I mean, again, the problem is finding a number, finding a problem that's difficult to solve and easy to verify. So it's like a P equal on P type of yeah. situation where we're, right. Yeah. yeah, right. So is there, I mean, in that, in that field, you know, is there any other problems that... Um, I mean, the, the, the other, I mean, the other coins tend to be going more toward, you know, things like proof of stake or something like that uh, and getting away from proof of work. Hmm. Uh, because, well, for one thing, it's the, the amount of time and the low transaction rate and things like that. It doesn't, there appears to be a certain amount of inflexibility there uh, that is really difficult to, to change that protocol, which is good. I mean, the, it's sort of like that rate is sort of like built into to Bitcoin and you don't want anybody, if you have Bitcoins, you don't really want anybody messing with that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what's there is not going to scale to to uh, to a high transaction rate, so so you know people a lot of people are wrestling a lot of cr good creative people are wrestling with this right now, and so it'll be interesting. It's an interesting space to watch. You know that's why I said explore carefully. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of activity in this area, and I mean the amount of activity that's gone on in the last six months since you know since I sent in this the proposal about this. It's just, it's just amazing. And you know, I referenced 
a bunch of articles that have just come out in the la like last week in the in the talk. So it's a it's a fascinating area. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much again.